You guys have requested a lot of different Disney films since I've started reviewing them on my channel, but none of them, and I mean none of them, were requested as much as 2008's Minutemen. So it was only a matter of time before I did it. No pun intended. <laughs> Shut your s- Minutemen follows a group of high school students, one of which being a 12 year old boy who skipped a bunch of grades, that build a time machine to save their classmates from embarrassing situations. At first, things go really well, but when they get a little carried away with the whole time traveling thing, they kind of like break the entire space-time continuum and have to fix it before it's too late. I, for one, remember this movie existing, and I am fairly certain that I caught it at least once during a rerun on Disney XD or something, but it's been years since I've seen it, so when I watched it for this video, it was basically like watching it for the first time. And, uh... I don't know, man, y'all were really hyping this thing up, and I'm a big fan of time travel in media, so... It should be an interesting ride, a ride that I am glad to share with you all. By the way, if this video flops, I'm never listening to you guys again. Kidding, kidding. <laughs> we'll see. Out of all the DCOMs out there, this is one of the only non-musical ones that I still see brought up nowadays. But why is that? Is it genuinely a good film, or has time not been kind to it? I'm not going to stop with these time jokes, so if you don't like them, you can leave. I guess we'll answer that question today. My name is Mr. Nostalgia, and today, we will be talking about the cult classic Disney Channel original movie, Minutemen. Next, in high school, everyone could use a do-over. Turn back the clock with Corey in the house as Jason Dolly in the premiere of Disney Channel's newest original movie, Minutemen. Minutemen premiered on Disney Channel on January 25th, 2008. This film has a really solid cast, like for real. First of all, we got the GOAT, Jason Dolly. I call him the GOAT because, well, his Disney Channel resume is insane. He was literally on the network for eight straight years, appearing in nine different projects. That's got to be a record or something. The movie also stars Luke Benward, who you guys probably know from Cloud Nine, Girl vs. Monster, or Good Luck Charlie. But me? Nah. I know him from the 2006 cult classic film How to Eat Fried Worms, which is truly a good movie and I can't wait to make a video on it. Other cast members include Chelsea Kane, who you might know from Jonas, Fish Hooks, and Starstruck. And the You Can't Touch This music video from the cast of Zeke Luther. We also got Nicholas Braun, who I didn't even realize played Zack from Sky High. The dude who could glow and stuff. That's another movie I plan on doing soon, man. I, I love this movie so much. The movie opens up with Jason Dolly's character Virgil hopping out of the school bus. But don't you just love when the credits match up with the characters on the screen? Virgil's best friend Derek hops out of the bus as well. Turns out it's the first day of school for the both of them and they begin to talk to each other about how excited they are to begin this new chapter of their lives. Just then, Chelsea Kane's character Stephanie greets the two boys, and it's now clear to us that these three have been best friends for a pretty long time. Gee, I wonder which one she ends up dating. Trust me, it happens in every trio of friends that contains two males and one female, or even two females and one male. Let's see, Freddie dated both Carly and Sam, Fletcher dated Olive, Moe's dated Ned, Topanga dated Corey, Oliver dated Lily, Lizzie dated Gordo, so yeah, it's definitely gonna happen. We learn a lot about these characters in this scene, and it kind of sets up some of the plot points of the film. For starters, we learn that Steph is trying out to be a cheerleader, and Derek cares a lot about his social status. He even mentions to Virgil that he didn't want him cramping his style or embarrassing him during football tryouts. And during said tryouts, Derek is stinking it up. Before he gets another shot at throwing the ball, a little boy interrupts him. He pulls up in some sort of high-powered automobile that resembles Muck from Bob the Builder. He nearly runs over everybody on the field, and Derek realizes that that is his neighbor, Charlie Tuttle. You see, Charlie is a little boy genius. Matter of fact, he's so smart that he was able to skip multiple grades and become a high schooler. Also, yeah, that's, that's Luke Benward's character. But Derek throws a football at Charlie, something that displeases Virgil, and it hits him in the head, which causes him to fall out of the machine. The football team starts harassing Charlie, and Virgil steps in to stop them until they just start doing the same thing to Virgil. Nowhere to be seen during this scene is Derek, who if you notice, isn't actually helping out his best friend Virgil. You see, Derek, as mentioned earlier, cares a lot about his social status. So much so that if it meant giving up his best friendship with Virgil, he'd do it. And unfortunately, that's something that happens a lot in high school. The football team ends up hanging Charlie and Virgil from the statue outside the school. Charlie explains to Virgil that the machine was supposed to be an alternative method of transportation, because he always gets bullied on the bus. It was supposed to save him from embarrassment, but yeah, it didn't end up doing that. <laughs> the two shake hands as a very unlikely friendship begins to form. You know, I just realized Jason Dolly has been in two Disney Channel projects where he knows a person named Charlie. That's pretty sick. <laughs> I don't know why I mentioned that. 
Three years have passed since that event, and Charlie and Virgil are closer than ever, but Stephanie and Derek seem to be rather distant. While walking into school, they come across this student on a motorcycle. He takes off his helmet and is revealed to be Zeke, played by Nicholas Braun. I kind of made a mistake earlier, I didn't know that this dude is much more known for his role in Succession, I kind of just introduced him as the Sky High dude. My fault, Nick. Oh, what, you guys thought I was going to make a Zeke and Luther reference? This is his name is Zeke, right? I already referenced it earlier, no need to. The streak of referencing Zeke and Luther in my videos continues. Oh wait, technically I forgot to do it in my Hatching P video. Let's just say that one isn't canon. Later that day in the cafeteria, while Derek and Stephanie get to sit with the popular kids, Virgil is sitting with the nerd squad. And man, these are some dorks, bruh. Some real poindexters in this scene. This girl goes up to Charlie and calls him Hummingbird. Now, she's actually my least favorite character, and it's not because she's a nerd. Her name is Jeanette, and according to Virgil, she has been interested in Charlie for two years. But she's just such a weird stalker about it, and it genuinely annoys me every time she's on screen. In the next scene, Virgil is in class when Charlie barges into the room saying that he needs him for something, and that it's an emergency. As the two talk in the hallway, Charlie mentions that although his adventure from three years ago didn't really go as planned, one aspect of the machine did work, the quantum accelerator. And he used some of the studies he's learned in the past to create a successful simulation of practical time travel. Virgil doesn't believe him, so Charlie has to convince him that not only is it possible, but it's also useful. In the next scene, oh, not this girl again. Get off my screen. Matter of fact, let's cut to commercial real quick. Yeah, there we go. We'll be right back with the premiere of Disney Channel's new original movie, Minute Man. Welcome to a school. Here we go. Where the expectations are sky high. I will determine where you will be assigned, hero or sidekick. No wonder some kids melt under pressure. Sidekick. And others are stretched to the max. Car. Hero. To survive here. Oh. Oh. You gotta be a super kid. But I thought you were a sidekick. Big mistake. Danielle Panabaker stars in Sky High. Tonight at 9, 8 central on Disney Channel. We're back with the premiere of Disney Channel's new original movie, Minute Man. Virgil agrees to finally help Charlie build his time machine thing, but he tells him that they're going to need someone who understands machinery to help them. Enter Zeke. Zeke agrees to help them build their machine, since he's always up for a challenge and also loves bean dip. It's like the exact opposite of me. The trio go to a junkyard to find the tools necessary to build it. They talk about some of the ways they're going to use the machine. Virgil and Zeke seem to agree on using it for the lottery, but that bothers Charlie. However, Charlie did promise Virgil that if he helped him build it, that he'd be the first person to use it for whatever they want. As they continue to talk about their plans, they realize that they need a big spacious place to build that also offers a lot of privacy. They go up to their principal the next day and ask him if they can start a new club. So at first glance, I was wondering why this dude looks so familiar, and then I realized that he's the dean from the show Community. But then after doing some research, it turns out that that's not the dean from Community. Nah bruh, that's the bald robot guy. From Aaron Stone. They just look exactly alike. He agrees to let them use Room 77 for their Back to the Future Club. Man, I wish my school had one of these. The trio begin to build their machine by borrowing stuff from school and around town, as the song Like Whoa by Ali and AJ is playing in the background. And you know what I'm gonna say. Yeah, that's a banger. They finish building their machine and turn it on. Virgil uses Charlie's cat, Albert Feinstein, as a test subject, which doesn't make Charlie very happy. But he comes back out the vortex safe and sound, only a bit cold from the temperatures of the vortex. And it worked. Albert Feinstein is officially the first time traveler in history, according to them at least. We then get an exterior shot of a building called Pacific Tech. The two, I guess scientists inside, noticed that there was a weird flux of energy in one specific area but brushed it off assuming it was anything major. I wish I could skip all the romance stuff because I mean time travel is so much cooler but this actually is kind of important. Stephanie finds out that Derek had been receiving French tutoring lessons from Jocelyn, another girl in school. She's skeptical at first, but then he convinces her that he was telling the truth. Virgil slides in and starts making jokes with Steph. She gets a little serious and tells him that Derek legitimately did try to stop those seniors from harassing him and that he does feel bad about what happened. You know, they say that people who don't let go of the past die faster and get more acne. Man, where were these girls when I was in school, bruh? She's so nice. Later, the three amigos get ready to go back in time and win the lottery. Can we talk about how cool this whole apparatus is for a second? The diving board, the portal, it's so sick. 
They arrive in the past and try to buy a lottery ticket, only for them to realize that they can't since they're not adults. So they go to a dancing robot guy and ask him to buy the ticket for them, but since they only have a couple minutes until they have to go back to the future, they tell him to just hold the ticket and they'll be back tomorrow. And after getting tipped a couple of times, he agrees to do it. The next day they go back to the area and the dancing robot dude did exactly what any actual person would do and bought the ticket for himself. He don't care about them kids. Chester gets his clothes stolen from his locker after the gym and is forced to go upstairs basically naked. After seeing all the kids laugh and make fun of him, Virgil and Charlie get the idea to use the time machine to go back in time and fix the embarrassing moments that happened to others. That way they don't have to experience the same pain that they did three years ago. Huh, that's a good idea. I should do that. Maybe I can finally put that time machine in my basement to good use. All right, let's do this. What do you guys think about Hatching Pete? I would like to know in the comments below. Wait, don't forget to reference Zeke and Luther. What are you talking about? Of course I reference Zeke and Luther in this. Oh, wait a minute, you're right. Thanks, Future Stalgia. Let me guess, you're finally doing that Miniman video? You know, you know it. it. See, See ya. ya. And uh, speaking of the comments below, let me know what movies you want me to review in the future. Who knows, maybe I'll finally do Dead Brother, starring Hutch Dano from Zeke and Luther. <laughs> the streak continues. Alright, sweet. Now I can finally sleep at night. What? Don't you guys have a time machine in your basement? But back at the lair, the trio are figuring out how they can make adjustments to their time machine while they're back in time. Just then, Jeanette finds out about their Back to the Future club and wants to join. So after a lot of arguing, they realize that if they tell her about their time travel expositions, she can be a part of the club and make adjustments for them so none of them need to stay back. She agrees, but first she tells them that if they're going to make this a thing, they're going to have to get a makeover. She lends them some clothes from Ski World, a store that her dad conveniently owns. They go back in time to the day Chester gets his clothes stolen, give him a new fit, run back to their lair, which accidentally causes them to knock down the vice principal and ruin whatever he was working on, and arrive back home. The vice principal says over to comms that he is looking for the students dressed in snowsuits, and when he finds them, they will be severely punished. You know, even though he's a nerd, it's kind of cool how they don't dress up Charlie like he is one. It's a nice change of pace. I don't know, that was just a random thought that I had while watching this. At the Burger Hour, the restaurant that all the kids hang out at after school, Jocelyn plays a prank on one of the waiters, which causes him to, uh, well... Go! Ah, uh, classic high school bullying. Gotta love it. Zeke was there when it went down and saw the whole thing happen. So the next day, he brings Virgil and Charlie, and they save the day. The following scene is basically just a montage of them doing heroic things, while run it back again by Corbin Blue plays. And yeah, that's, that's another banger. Classic late 2000s Disney Channel music. During the montage, Charlie, Virgil, and Zeke are all getting watched by mysterious people in sunglasses and big black trucks. Never a good combination. During lunch, Steph approaches Virgil and tells him that she got accepted into UC Belmont, which is a college apparently. But it's not a done deal yet. Since she applied for a cheerleading scholarship, she has to audition in front of a scout. Something I actually kind of appreciate about this movie is how they're able to give subtle hints as to the state of Stephanie and Derek's relationship. Earlier in the movie, Derek is seen talking with a random girl while Stephanie is talking to Virgil, and given what happens later in the movie, this was definitely done on purpose. And just now, after she got accepted into her dream college, the first person she ran and told was Virgil instead of Derek. I don't know why that impresses me so much, it's a pretty common writing trope, but considering the last couple of movies I reviewed had such poor writing, I guess it was nice to see something kind of clever for once. Nervously, Charlie tells Virgil and Zeke something that he had been keeping from them this whole time. Some of the research that they use was stolen <laughs> from NASA, and if they keep using the machine, they might find out about it and send him to jail. Wow, that's pretty important info to leave out. But halting use of the time machine is something that'll be easier said than done, because the next day we find out that Stephanie fell off the top of the pyramid during practice and broke her leg, which will cause her to miss her audition. Virgil tries to convince Charlie that they need to do one last time travel mission. The Minutemen agree to do one last time adventure to save Steph. When they arrive, the Dean for Community sees them as he drives by, which causes a car accident between him, the robot dude from earlier, and the woman. Wasted opportunity to not have robot dude pull up in like a really nice 
uh, Lamborghini or something, considering he won the lottery. <laughs> Stephanie falls from the pyramid and Virgil scoops in and catches her. Get out. If I had a dollar for every time Jason Dolly played a character in a DCOM that was trying to conceal his identity instead of a certain phrase that gave his identity away to the main love interest, I'd have two dollars. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Oh yeah, there's this one subplot in the movie where because of the changes to the timeline, some of the kids that were getting picked on are now acting like bullies themselves. And when Charlie notices that, along with some other changes to the timeline, he realizes that their actions are starting to catch up to them. Stephanie pulls up to Virgil's house to thank him for his actions as a Minuteman. He's quick to deny it at first, but after she puts everything together, he basically just lets it slip that they're time travelers. This dude would be the worst superhero ever, man. Just letting his secret identity slip out like that? Come on, bro. At the football game, Derek's team is play- Hey, isn't that the announcer dude from Hatching Pete? They have bro in this movie playing basically the same character from that one. That dude is always playing a sports commentator, bro. Oh, yeah. As Derek is about to throw the ball, Chester comes in and- I. I I don't know why he did this. Is, is this a thing in high school football games? Well, whatever he did, it ended up distracting Derek and he got tackled as a result. Off camera, I guess, Stephanie told Derek about Virgil and the other guys being time travelers because the next day, Derek tries to convince Virgil to do one more jump into the past to save the football team. Virgil really doesn't want to, especially since he knows how it'll affect Charlie, but Derek tells him that he did really try to stop those guys from harassing him that day three years ago during freshman year. He tells him that he does genuinely want them to be friends again, like how they were before. And because of that, Virgil agrees to help him out. The Minutemen go into the past, change the timeline, and arrive back home safe and sound. Derek is very appreciative of what Virgil did for him, so much so that he invites him over to his house for a party, and Virgil agrees to go even though he had told Charlie that he would watch a weather program with him that night. Virgil calls Charlie the next morning and apologizes to him a bunch of times. But in the middle of their conversation, right after Charlie forgives him, Virgil gets a call from Steph. It's revealed that she caught Derek kissing Jocelyn. Wait, you mean he wasn't going to her for tutoring lessons? Whoa, I didn't see that one coming. I knew it too. Then why did you... All right, never mind. You're an amazing friend. Yeah. Friend. <laughs> Man, I felt that pain straight through the screen. That's tough. Not as tough as that. What in the world? Charlie ended up being right. All of the time jumps they have been doing the past couple of weeks have been damaging the space-time continuum. The laboratory dudes are starting to catch on now and are comparing notes about the energy surges. More on this later. I want you to go back in time. Stop Stephanie from busting me with Jocelyn. Wow. I hate this guy. Surely Virgil is going to give this guy a firm no. On his walk home, Virgil gets kidnapped by the FBI. So did Charlie and Zeke. They tell them about the missing files from NASA that they traced to their high school. And although Charlie was about to squeal, Virgil tells them that legally, unless they charge them of something, they can't keep them there. So they let them go. But obviously we know that this is not over. We get a classic friendship movie scene where the three friends argue with each other and break up. Although this time, I am definitely on Charlie and Zeke's side. They both tell him off about how he shouldn't have been so selfish and careless with the whole time machine thing, and they end up leaving him. Surely you'd think this is when he learned his lesson, but nah, he actually tells Derek that he's gonna go back in time anyway and stop Stephanie from finding out about him and Jocelyn. In the next scene, Jeanette manages to get into Charlie's house thanks to his mom. But when he wakes up, Charlie, thanks to a study he conducted, finds out about some unfortunate news. We created a... What do you think? Like, hello? So, Charlie and Jeanette run to wherever those FBI guys took them and come clean about everything. The FBI dudes already knew, that's why they contacted the two scientists from earlier. What they didn't know about, however, is the existence of the black hole. Charlie explains to them all the science stuff that I'm not going to bother recapping because it probably doesn't even actually add up scientifically anyway. Just, you ever watch the season 1 finale of The Flash? Yeah, that's basically this. They have to stop the spread of the black hole before it reaches the entire world, and they have slightly less than four hours to do it. At the dance, why is there always some sort of dance in these films? Derek approaches Virgil about the whole time traveling thing, and he tells him that everything is set. They're just going to wait until they announce the prom king and queen. Steph and Virgil actually end up winning the prom king and queen, which surprises everybody besides Virgil because he actually went back in time and stuffed the ballot box. They accept their crowns and head back to the dance floor where they begin to get really close to each other. Like, really close. But Derek pulls him away from Steph because he wants him to go back in time for him. Charlie along with the FBI and some other guys in suits pull up to tell Virgil about the black hole and how they need to stop it. And time is of the essence because the black hole is beginning to expand more and more. 
Everyone goes to the lair and comes up with a plan. Charlie says that the only way to stop the wormhole is if they go inside of it and reverse the polarity using an invention that Charlie made that will allow them to do it remotely. So, for the last time, the Minutemen suit up and go on one final mission. But this time, to save the world. Can we talk about how these visual effects aren't actually that bad? Like yeah, it's not legitimate movie quality, but for a DCOM, it's pretty solid. Not gonna bother fact checking this, but I do feel like this was probably Disney's most expensive non-musical decon. Don't go away. We'll be back with the Disney Channel movie. We're back with the Disney Channel movie. The kids crash land and begin to work. And well, everything seems to be going as planned. They now have to wait 20 minutes until the vortex touches back to the ground so they can go back to wherever they came from. But uh, looks like the vortex took them to a very important day in history. Well, their history at least. If you remember, Charlie's quantum powered machine from earlier in the movie uses some of the same energy from the time machine, and that energy caused the vortex to suck them into that area, since that was the first time the energy had been exposed to the earth. Realizing the opportunity that he has, Virgil runs off to try to stop the incident from happening, so he doesn't have to be remembered as a nerd anymore. As he's about to intervene, Charlie stops him and delivers a very heartfelt speech. Down there is we became friends. This day that you hate so much, this is my favorite. Man, look at that fake football. <laughs> they did. Oh, sorry, Charlie. My fault. But Virgil thinks hard about what he's going to do, but he didn't have to think for too long because it becomes clear that Derek didn't actually try to help Virgil and Charlie. Matter of fact, he made things worse just to fit in. It became clear to Virgil that what he thinks he wants isn't going to make him happy in the end because he'd have to give up who he truly is a minute man. Charlie and Zeke rush to make it back to the portal in time, but reality starts to sink in with them. They're a mile away, and there's no way they'd make it back in time. But just then, Virgil pulls up in that skirt skirt and tells the gang he's sorry and that he wouldn't change anything because the life that he's living now is priceless. He didn't actually say that, but that's more or less what he said. They continue to make their way to the portal and cause several near accidents in the process. Virgil misses his turn, which throws them off the route. But fortunately for them, Zeke had been carrying a grappling hook on him since the beginning of the movie, and he finally got the chance to use it in this scene. I love when stuff like that happens in movies. Those full circle moments, man, can't beat it. They finally make it to the portal and enter the wormhole. They come out all in one piece, well, except for the rocket car. That thing got cooked. Nobody saw that giant portal? No? Okay. The portal took them to the first day that they time traveled, but before they actually did it. So as a result, the Dean from Community has no recollection of ever having beef with the snowsuit guys. In the library, Virgil exposes Derek's relationship with Jocelyn since he was acting like a jerk to him and the other two guys. It appears these two won't ever be friends again, but I don't think Virgil really cares. He has much more important things to take care of. Virgil puts the moves on Stephanie and says that if he ever had the opportunity to go back in time, the one thing he'd change is that he'd tell Stephanie how he really felt about her. And she says that given the same opportunity, she do the same thing. But before they get the chance to finish their conversation, Charlie comes up with a new idea. Teleportation. He starts to tell Virgil about it, but gets quickly dragged away. And as the camera pans out, we finish up a very solid story about friendship, time travel, and uh, grappling hooks. Samsung Mobile is a proud sponsor of Minuteman on Disney Channel where the imagination inspires new ideas. So, final thoughts on Minutemen. Yeah, no, this movie slaps. I, I get it now. I get it now. This is definitely one of the very best DCOMs. I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, where do I start? First of all, this is pretty much a perfect Disney Channel original movie. Now when I say this, I'm not saying it's a perfect film, because it definitely has some issues, but for a Disney Channel original movie, yeah, I'd say this is pretty perfect. The characters in this movie are all very solid. Man, Luke Benward killed it as Charlie. He is such a likable character, and one thing I love about how they wrote him is that yes, he's basically the smartest person on the planet, but he's not a complete jerk about it. He's not constantly reminding everyone that he's the smartest person in the room. He doesn't purposely try to make everyone else feel dumb. He still acts like a kid, which is something very big for me because they could have easily just written him like young Sheldon or something. 
I've never seen young Sheldon. I'm just assuming that he more or less just acts like an adult. S tier Disney Channel character. Great job, Luke. Jason Dolly's Virgil, on the other hand, is still a good character, but throughout the movie, his little subplot of still wanting to be popular even though he saved so many people's social lives as a Minuteman wasn't really working for me. I get it, he's a 17 year old kid who has something embarrassing happen to him. I don't blame him for wanting to reverse it, but I think I would have rather seen him kind of change his mind after performing all of those heroic acts. He's still good though, don't get me wrong, I mean Dolly doesn't miss. Plus, I guess someone had to take advantage of the whole time traveling thing in order to cause the black hole, and out of the three characters in the film, Virgil made the most sense. Zeke was the perfect third character. He didn't have as big of a subplot as the other two, but his presence was felt, stayed solid throughout the movie, and ultimately saved the day with his grappling hook. The other characters played their parts as well. Chelsea Kane killed the Stephanie. She was very likable throughout the film. I hated Derek because I guess I was kind of supposed to, so it means the actor did a good job. And, uh... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it when it comes to characters. But like I said, this movie is pretty much a perfect decom. A surprisingly well-written story, solid characters to support it, a couple musical bangers, and what sometimes matters the most is that it was memorable. What I also appreciate is that it didn't have any like super cringy moments like other decoms. You guys know me, I'm not very forgiving when it comes to stuff like that. The only other flaws I could think of is that some of the time travel logic was a bit uneven, but I have learned from my years of reading comic books is that sometimes it's best not to think about it. So I'll do just that. I will rate Minutemen a solid 8 out of 10. It's a very good movie and I definitely recommend it to you if you haven't seen it in a while. But what I want to know is what you think about the movie. Let me know in the comments below. As always, hit that like button if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you're new. I'm Mr. Nostalgia and uh, it's time I got out of here. Okay, bye.